Oh, there you go. Recorded. Yay. Cool. All right. Cool. Yay us. Um, hi. Ready to start? Yeah, whenever, whenever. Awesome. All right, we'll do this. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brittany. I work in the Office of Student Activities and Resource Center. Um, and we are here to do TAN and Teaches today specifically about voting uh, because we are, I think, five days away from the mm -hmm. election at this point. Uh, whether or not we'll have results right away is certainly up for grabs. Um, but a lot of people have already cast their ballot, started voting, whether that's mail-in or early voting. Um, so I'm here with one of our amazing TANM professors. I'm going to let him introduce himself to talk a little bit about the process of voting and the influence of engineering in voting. So you want to cool. introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Awesome. So hi, I'm Luke Dubois. Um, I'm the co-director of the IDM program at Tandon. And um, in my spare time, I have a collection of, um, of voting machines, which we're going to show you. Um, some of them, um, most of them from the last century, and some of them as old as um, you know the 1940s. Um, and I thought it might be fun to sort of talk about, you know, how how they work, how they didn't work, you know, um, what are some of the pitfalls in them, and also, you know, a little bit about. Um, yeah, how they were designed and what the, why they were designed the way they were designed. And so um, I guess like, I think the one thing to start with is just to, to do, I have like a super quickie, just bunch of pictures to show on my computer about the sort of history of these things, just to, just to kind of talk you through those. And then, and then we can kind of walk around and like pets around with these things. Awesome. That, that's cool. Um, so if everybody will humor me, I'm going to like sort of share my screen for a second. So the, um, so if you think about voting in the United States, you, you, you tend to think about, um, you know, this kind of like what, what they talk about is they talk about this, the, the, when people who, people who work in the elections industry or whatever, talk about this kind of like five part mandate in voting, right? So you want voting to be accessible, you want voting equipment to be usable, you want the voting process to be transparent, but at the same time, you want it to be a private, exercise right uh, something something that, that you can do privately and you want it to be something that's secure so you want to make sure that your vote is counted that nobody could spy on you etc 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 this was not always the case so in um colonial america right voting was a public and vocal affair so this is a this is sort of a painting about what um you know what a what a colonial legislative election looked like in the in the in the 1750s in the United States, right? So you've got you've got all your all your you know you know white men of property, right? So the people who are eligible to vote, and they show up and they 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 line up and they you know face an, a, a a person who's a vote recorder and they say like I'm voting for Brittany for president, right? And then and then. The, the 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 person in blue will like you know write it down and you do it in full public view of everyone right and so you know this is aspirationally super lovely and civic minded and all that kind of stuff but it's incredibly flawed in that it is you know you're 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 basically outing who you're who you're voting for and so it's not a private act and so um you know if 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 i was voting in saying I'm voting for you to, for president, one reason I might be doing that is because you're my boss and you're in line behind me, right? So th this is not a great, this is maybe not a great situation. And so they started um, using ballots. They started using, you know, ballot boxes, you know, starting around like 1790. So like sort of like within the first, you know, kind of 20 years of this place being a country, they were like, you know what, we have to like, we got to work on the privacy issue like you really you really shouldn't have to voice vote in an election and the way we think of our modern ballot right um we think you know we think of it as is you get um you get sort of options you get all your options and you get to check what you want that's actually much newer this is this is the term for this in, in voting technology is an australian ballot which was first used in australia prior to that a ballot was really just a piece of paper in the box and so the Republican Party, you know, might give you a printed piece of paper to just drop in the box, right? The Democratic Party, 
you know, might very much do the same. So like, a, this is what a, uh, this is what a democratic ballot looked like from the, from the same time. So what they would do is, you know, the, the party officials would hand you out your, your ticket. They would be like, Brittany, just throw this in the box. And that would, and that would mean you'd effectively register your vote down the line for everybody that was eligible in that party, right? There was no, and then if you wanted to vote for Mickey Mouse, you would ask for a blank ballot and write down Mickey Mouse, right? But like, but like, but to make it easy, the two main political parties in the United States like mass printed full slate ballots to give to people to vote and they would go in the boxes, right? And so around 1870, we realized, you know, sort of like after the Civil War, we realized that was maybe not optimal either. So let's go to go to what we now recognize as a, as a full ballot, right? This is a thing where I get to, I get to check boxes. So this is from the 1890s. Um, and I can, I can, you know, if I put a check in the box next to the party, that means I'm doing a party line ballot. I want to, so if I, if I check in that circle that says democratic, that means I'm voting for all the Democrats. If I check in the circle that says Republican, that means I'm voting for all the, all the Republicans, or I can split my ticket by doing a la carte voting in the square boxes for the candidates I like, right? Um, so, and at a certain point, this whole situation inevitably became mechanized, right? Or, or there was a desire to, to, to mechanize it, right? To make it easier to count, to make it easier to report, all that kind of stuff. Um, the first company that really um, took this on was a, was a company called Myers. Um, this is, they had, a, they had a thing called the US Standard Voting Machine Company. This is what they looked like. This is from the early 1900s. Um, if you are a New Yorker and you've been voting long enough in New York State, you might actually still recognize the core interaction mechanic of this thing, because this stuff was used well into the 20th century. These are switches and levers, right? So you would sort of go into a booth, you would pull a curtain, um, and then what you would do is you would, you would use these little toggle switches to vote for your candidates, and the big lever at the top would sort of set the machine one way and then register your vote the other way, and that's, and that's all it was. Um, so you can think of it, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical computer, right? It's not even an analog electric, there's no electricity. It's not, it's not, there's no electronics in it. It's literally, you can think of it as just there being like a bunch of um, like, like, like click counters in the back that only get hit when a vote is registered. So like, if you think about, you know, when you go to a nightclub and there's a bouncer counting how many people are in the space, imagine the back of the machine has like a hundred of those and they're all auto tagging whenever one of these levers is down. That's kind of how it works, right? Um, there's a whole security protocol or regime around that that I'll show you when we actually look at one of these for real. It became pretty quickly a duopoly, these machines. So, so, the, so this company didn't last very long. Um, and the two big companies that took the place for the most the majority of the 20th century was there was a company called um, AVM, the Automatic Voting Machine Corporation. And then there was a company called SHOUP, S-H-O-U-P. And they made most of the voting machines in the United States. You would recognize SHOUP machines because they were kind of modernist. Um, they were kind of gray and had little toggle boxes. The AVM machines were kind of gunmetal green, um, but they were, you know, they were sort of comparable. Um, so this is a shoot machine. Uh, this is the 1980 presidential election. So this is the Reagan Carter election. Um, so when you, um, so they're mechanized for a while and then before you know it, computers start getting into the way, in the way. So by the, you know, so in the post-war period, we start having things like, um, you know, the Votomatic company. And this is a thing where the, the voting mechanism the way you vote is still mechanical. You're still physically doing something, but the counting system becomes electronic and automated, right? So this is sort of like a punch card, you know, this is a punch card ballot. Um, we have a punch card ballot machine that I'll show you that's got a very cool like kind of pedigree to it. But the idea is you would use some kind of device to poke holes in this situation, drop it off in a ballot box at your polling place. And then once those were all collected, a machine would go to work, like something made by the by by IBM would kind of count it all up, right? Um, and you know, and then the last version of it that is is in use today in some states, though not all states, is um. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. Is this it? I hope this is it. No, that didn't work. Um, is the you know is a is a Diebold machine? I guess that image didn't download, so I'll just do it for you. Um, so this is what you know voting machines tend to look like today. This is a computer, right? 
And if you are um, the kind of person who's um, interested in or concerned with cybersecurity, the, um, the big conversation with these machines is, you know, is there a paper trail? Is there not a paper trail? Is this thing hackable? Is it not hackable? Early dive bulb machines ran a commercial operating system. They ran Windows CE. Um, so they ran the same operating system that you would use for your you know, smartphone or whatever. And so the idea was, you know, maybe somebody could break into it. Maybe somebody could change the software. Maybe somebody could inject malware. So the security issue is very, very like a clear and present concern with these machines. But this is kind of where we are today. When you vote in New York State now, you still have a paper, you know, paper ballot, but there's a computer in the way of counting your, your interaction. And the, and the main company for that is, is, is Dybul. So that's my um, that's my rant about 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 the sort of history of these things yeah. a little bit, um, and so I thought, what should we do? Do you want to turn on your yeah, your tablet uh, and we can yeah, we can take a tour around? Let's mute yours. Okay, we'll let's mute me. There we go. All right. All right, I'm gonna turn off my speaker. Okay, and Randy, do you want to pin the video so that everybody sees this one big? I think that's the easiest way to do it. Sure. All right. Got it. Okay. So let's start. Let's start with the big guy. Okay. Let's look at the big guy. Um, so this thing, <laughs> you can see this. Right. Yeah. So we this thing, see. here we go. Let's, let's just move the curves out of the way. So this thing okay. is, um, sure you know, 600 pounds of goddamn American democracy. Okay. So this is a, this is a AVM machine from 1945. Um, uh, it would um, ordinarily come in a box, so it, it fits this whole situation cranks down to this box of lids. So there's a crank on the side, you would sort of crank it down. It's, got, it's on wheels, it's incredibly heavy. Um, and you know, you crank it up and it, and it works. This was used in New York State as recently as 2016, right? So we were using this in, in, in New York State until very recently. Um, it has a light, it has a curtain, same curtain rod, so I just pinned it back so we could see. And the basic shtick is, you know, you walk in, you pull the curtains, you pull the lever to the right to enable it, you do your voting. Right? Um, and then you vote, you register, right? And then you walk out. Um, easy, right? Um, what's a little bit more complicated about it is it has some additional things. Um, the top row, which is very common in voting machines, are, are for ballot initiatives. So these are meant to be yes, no questions. They're designed so that the switches block one another. So if I vote yes on something, I can't also vote no on it. Um, it also um, supports something called party line voting. So you can be like, I only like this party. And it will vote down the line for everybody in that party. Um, this, this mechanism is increasingly understood as unconstitutional. So in New York State, you don't do this anymore. There, if in a, a mechanical voting machine would have a shield over this now. Um, in Texas, this election is the first election that's actually mm -hmm. disallowing party line voting. Um, and then over here, these are um, man, these are drop-in ballots. So these are for write-in. So this is if I want to vote for Mickey Mouse, I can put a piece of paper in here, close it, register. Cool. So far, so, so good. Cool. Yeah. Super fun, right? Um, so the, if you look around, let's do like a quick tour of the insides and outsides. So this gizmo, let me just put the curtains back down so we can walk around it. This gizmo is designed to be quite secure. And so there are keys. And the keys are kind of like a nuclear missile silo. They're numbered. And in an ordinary scenario, um, the voter custodian keeps these in, in their possession. And the voting machine cannot be simultaneously engaged for voting and have the back open so you can view it. So I've hacked this thing so that we can do both, but normally the act of opening the back disables the voting, right? Um, and so the enable key is on the side over here. Um, there's a public counter here showing you how many people have voted. Um, there's a, there's a little switch that you can do to basically shut it down, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and then this is what the counters look like on the back. And so you can see each possible position has a counter running. So this means like 249 people have voted for selection 15A, 
You get it? So like each one has a different thing. Um, and then there's a double marking paper rule here that doesn't have any paper on it. It would be punched, right? Along with this as a backup recording. And the gears, you know, the actual physical mechanism of the thing is down here, right? So you can sort of see what's going on here. There are these little, there are these little levers. Again, it's just like, you know, the, 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 the bouncer at the nightclub with the little clicker. That's really, it's a really simple mechanism. There's nothing particularly sophisticated about the way it's recording other than just it's, 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 it's pretty secure, right? And so there's a reset, there's a reset system where I can zero all these out if I want to. Um, there's a couple interesting things about it. Um, one of my favorite um, things is this thing called the question lockout. Um, this, if I pull it with the key in, will disable part of the machine, right? And that is for um, uh, states or localities that have partial suffrage. So um, this company pre, you know, predated, or this company was making voting machines, um, you know, before the before the you know before the Nineteenth Amendment, right? And so you could have. Um, you know, look at look how's where women could only vote locally and not for not for federal officials or something like that. Um, after the 19th Amendment, you still had things like, um, you know, in some places they would allow 18 year olds to vote locally, but you had to be 21 before you could vote for president, stuff like that. And so what they would do is they would basically like look at you and either age you or gender you and flip this switch and then half the machine wouldn't work. All right. Um, and so that's what it's designed for. It doesn't do anything on this machine because this machine is from 1945. So at some point somebody disabled it because in New York State we don't do that, right? So, this, so, it's, so, it's, so it's broken here. But that's the basic thing with this. Pretty cool. Yeah. It's crazy heavy. Um, Much different than what we see in our uh, our polling places today. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But these, but these were used for like almost a whole century. So this one. You know, just to give you a, what, what, so that's a big one. That, 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 that big guy I showed you is what you would see in a city. You would see it in, you would see, you know, you, if you went to like, uh, if you went to like a school in New York City, you would see that. This is more for like, you know, if you, if your polling place was like a rural high school or something like that, you would have these smaller boxes. And this is an interesting one. This is from 1960, um, Cook County, Illinois. And so this is, um, the, you know, the, the, the two the two candidates are, are John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Um, same mechanism, right? I pull the thing to the right, I flip, flip my little choices, I pull the thing to the left, it records. Um, the thing about these machines is I talked to you about like all the security that goes into them, right? Like you need the keys. Oh, and the thing I missed is um, typically in the, in the tallying phase, right? There'd be the custodian and then there would be a, a, a Republican official and a Democratic official doing the counting, and one, and they would sort of do a coin toss about who would read the counters and who would read the paper tape. And all three of those people had to agree for the vote to actually be recorded, right? So, like, if you were reading the counters and I was like, "I see 279 for my guy," and then the other, and then I'm reading the paper and I'm like, "No, it says 240. What are you talking about?" Then we've got a problem, right? So there's. So there's a sort of there's sort of a, a a security protocol around the whole system. This thing is the same thing. This would have counters in the back, but that doesn't mean they aren't hackable. And so this is what the inside of this guy looks like, or, or one of them looks like. And these little levers you can jam them. And the way they used to jam them is they would jam them with pencil lead. So you would get like what you would think of as the inside of a pencil, shove them in the shims of the candidate you wanted to lose. And maybe one out of every three times their vote wouldn't get reported. And there would be no evidence because eventually it would grind down to powder, right? And so, um, you know, uh, people will say that, you know, John F. Kennedy stole the 1960 election by instructing the Cook County election officials to put pencil lead in the voting machine in Chicago. What a low tech hack, right? Pretty good low tech. So, di so different than uh, 2016. Yeah, very different than 2016. <laughs> Um, you know, and these are some like ephemera about it. This is what this is what a write-in ballot looks like. This is some kid voted for his friend. I love that. It's pretty cool. His name's Ryan. <laughs> um, this is showing you this was what was in that big voting machine when I when I uh, got it. This is from 2016. So this is like what about the about the school district operating budget for like Saugerties, New York. Um, and then um, 
let's look at and then let's look at the the guy over there okay so, the, so these are these are you know these are sort of mid-century right they're from the 40s 50s 60s this guy over here my favorite i love this one it's kind of falling apart um this is um this is a company called Votomatic. And uh, it is uh, from the era of, I still do a physical mechanism to vote, but then a computer will tally the votes, right? You would think. And this has a very specific pedigree. So the way this works is you have a card do, 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 and you pull it off or you don't pull it off, but the election official pulls it off and gives it to you and says, you know, you know Brittany, here's your ballot. And then what you do is you come in here. Ordinarily, there's a left-hand side of this thing, but it broke off. Um, and you feed it through. And you make sure the little like hole guys are in there. And then you pick up this um, suspiciously dangerous looking object that is tethered to the thing. <laughs> so this is your first problem. This is your first problem, right? And then you flip through this book and vote. And you will be able to guess the pedigree of this as soon as I open it. So this is Lee County, Florida, November 7th, 2000, right? Our presidential candidates are named George W. Bush and Al Gore. And this is the famous butterfly ballot. And this is a Florida 2000 voting machine. And this whole situation is what we in the business refer to as a UX problem. And so, um, and so if, I, if I do this right, I would say, well, you know, I want to vote. I'm going to vote for Ralph Nader, right? So I'm going to click this and go, funk, right? And then I'm going to go to the next line. And you don't really see this, but the but the holes have like shimmied one column over. And now, who am I voting for, Congressman? I have, I have no idea. I'm going to vote for this dude. I'm going to vote for this dude for representative. And then, yeah, I got to vote for a treasurer. I got to vote for a commissioner for education. I got to vote for a state senator and you know, whatever. I keep on going. Doo, 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 doo. Am I voting for sheriff? Vote for this guy for sheriff. Am I voting for tax collector, county commissioner, county commissioner? And now I'm done. Right? Turn back to the first page and I pull it out. And voila, these are the holes. Here's the problem though. If I didn't do a very good job, let's see if I can, let's see if I can not do a very good job. Um, like say I wanted to vote for, for George W. Bush and I just wasn't, did I do it? Yeah, I kind of did it. It'll partially punch through. And the little, um, the little like paper dipshits in there, um, the technical term for them, yes, I did it. Um, <laughs> the technical term for them is these little, um, little, little perforated things in there. They're called chads. Right, C H A D, Chad, like a guy you knew in high school, Chad. Um, and um, and 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 if you don't push the hole all, all the way through, you get something called a hanging Chad. And if you get a hanging Chad, the big question in 2000 in Florida was, does that count, right? And so, this is the problem with these machines. If you're interested in the 2000 election and hanging Chads, pregnant Chads, and more things about guys named Chad, mm -hmm. uh, the New York Times Daily Pod actually did uh, a podcast on that this week and super, super interesting goes into how the chads are attached and four prongs and how many you had to cut off and all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So super interesting. Good time. Anyway, so this is, this is, this is what I have to show you. And this is how an election was won. This is how an election was Bad won. user interface. Bad user interface. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I have to show you. What should, what should we talk about? So I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got into this. I mean, we can also switch back to that camera if you want. Um, but how you got into this and how this kind of became an interest for yeah, you. Yeah, let's let's switch cameras again. Let me mute and do my do my little let's turn up the volume for a minute. Um, okay, cool. So now we're just talking. How did I get into this? Oh, so I got it well, so I got into specifically voting machines for an art show that I did in 2016. So um, I acquired all of these on eBay and in government oversupply stores and like a bunch of places. So I found that big guy in, a, um, in an amazing warehouse upstate. There was a government oversupply store. And so basically you could buy anything you wanted for it's like weight and raw materials. Huh. And so you could buy like school chalk by the or you could buy like old fax machines or old furniture or whatever. And so I bought that thing for like 200 bucks or something like that if I could get it out of it. 
Um, and, uh, and it's, um, and, and, and that's how I acquired them. And I was doing a show called Choice is Yours. I was doing an art show called Choice is Yours, where I took these machines, extruded them into sculpture. So I take the front off the back and kind of like split them. And then I would put a camera inside that could actually watch how you were voting. Um, and you would make choices and then little, little things would happen on a little movie screen, on a little video screen. And so one of the boxes made um, crazy algorithmic poetry. So like based on the switches, you could say, I want, I want to use words from Pride and Prejudice and words from Frankenstein. And they would make you a weird mashup of Pride and Prejudice and Frankenstein. Um, I had one that would make music. I would have one that would um, draw little graphics and make melodies. I had one that would collage images. The big guy, I don't know if you noticed, but the actual candidates on those labels are all words. Yeah. And those words are from um, the Myers-Briggs personality test. And so the way this piece worked was you would say who you wanted. And so you would go in there, set it, and be like, I want someone who's adventurous and kind and charismatic and funny and whatever. And then you would do it. And then it would try to find you that person on the internet. It would search for all those terms on the internet and try to find you. That person and, and the unfortunate um, truth of that is usually when that happens, you get an obituary because that's the only time you use so many nice words about a person is when they're dead. Interesting right? and depressing at the same time. Super depressing. So it would, yeah. you, you would get basically what happened was we got we got nothing but obituaries and um, film reviews to Jennifer Lawrence films. Oh. That's what it always came okay. back. So it would it would always be like it would always be like you know. You know, Mrs. So and So was remembered as being charming and kind and whatever. Or it'll be like Jennifer Lawrence plays a plucky, adventurous, lovely whatever. And yeah. those were your two options. So that was yeah. You got ads for the Hunger Games. Yeah. So the 100%. piece, the piece yeah. didn't quite work the way I thought it was going to, um, but it was interesting. And uh, and so that was the the project. And um, yeah, and I had all this voting ephemera. Jonathan Sofer, who's my department chair in TCS, wrote a really lovely. Um, wall text for the show. There was kind of a history of voting in the United States, talking about, you know, you know, um, who got the suffrage when, and all that kind of stuff. And and it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. That's how I got into this stuff. But I've always been really interested in in you know, like civic machines, right? So like this is this is a really interesting, from an engineering perspective, these things are really interesting because they're 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 machines that were developed for like you know, like a civic act or a political act. And like, we don't have a lot of those. You don't have, you don't have like a deep bench in human civilization of like gizmos that exist to help you be a citizen yeah. or be a person, right? So like, so like you've got things like um, the security systems around like your driver's license, or you've got things like passports and passport control and customs entry equipment and whatever but like voting machines are pretty much like the only thing we've got we're like the only point of this gizmo is to help us be a country right is to help us function as a country there's no other reason for this thing to exist and i think that's kind of awesome and i think that's kind of cool and so i was sort of interested in them in that way you know so one of the things when talking about the kennedy nixon machine is this idea of you know, voter fraud so and uh, and hacking hacking the vote. Obviously, something we've been talking a lot about as a uh -huh. result of 2016, and now with all the mail-in voting for 2020, a lot of talk about voter fraud. You know, how hard is it now with the type of voting machines that we use now to to hack an election, and and how do we do? How does that happen? Well, it's like you know, so there, so so there's so there's there's like you know, there's three points of failure in this whole thing. There's the machines themselves are like really kind of only one of them. Then there's like the humans beforehand and the humans after, right? So the, so I think people who um, claim that vote by mail is fraudulent, what they're what they're leveraging is they're leveraging this kind of edge case idea that you might figure out some way to vote by mail and then show up by person and vote in person. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is this, your state election officials don't have their shit together and they'll accidentally count you twice and never catch you, right? That's the, that's the, the, the myth of like, that, that, that's the premise when 
when people in this country are like, vote by mail leads to fraud, right? Or, or somehow that voting by mail, your ballot gets matched up against a different database that's weaker or less correct or whatever, right? Um, the United States is a really interesting country, right? The, this way, the, the, the United States is, is one of the, is probably the, 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 the only country in, in, in the world that, um, you know, sort of actively tries to make it harder for people to vote on a regular basis yeah. Yeah. and yet claims it's a democracy, right? So th this is a, and a lot of it is taking this premise going back to like my five part, you know, step of like, you know, accessibility, usability, transparency, privacy, security, like looking, poking holes in those things and saying, we can't allow this to happen because it violates one of these things, right? So all of the motions from both parties before this, before the um, local courts and the Supreme Court right now over the election that's happening in five days are typically disputing a local election law against one of those five things. They're either saying, we can't vote by mail because it's not secure, or we can't allow val ballots to be counted after the fact because then, you know, then it's like it, we no longer have a transparent process. The deadline's the deadline and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. or, um, or, you know, this whole like we only, you know, I, I'm only going to have a ballot box in every county, even if your county is like 10,000 miles wide. That, that, that calls to accessibility, mm -hmm. right? Or you're gonna say, um, we're gonna design um, the ballot in such a way so that it doesn't work, you know, for, um, for persons with disabilities or it's not wheelchair accessible, right? That's a different kind of accessibility. That the big machine that I showed you, right? That AVM machine, a newer version of it, like starting in the 1970s, that lever moved down to the bottom so you can yeah, use it as a wheelchair. Yeah, absolutely. Mover, right, that's actually an accessibility issue if you're under, like five foot two or you're seated, you can't get at that thing. Yeah, I wonder, right? yeah. I'm about five one. I probably couldn't yeah. reach it easily. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's a little bit yeah. so that was like a, that's a design flaw in that thing. And in the, you know, in, in at some point the AVM corporation in the 60s would have fixed it, right? They would have moved it down to the mm -hmm. bottom. Um, you know, so there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff around the edges. I I I have never really felt, and I've talked to a lot of people who like work on these things. I've, I've never really been given the impression that voting in America is nearly as insecure or fraudulent or easily hacked as people think it is. Um, we have a colleague at Princeton in computer science who figured out pretty easily how to, um, you know, cryptographically break into the computer Diebold machines, right, in 2006, right, so it proved that it was pretty easy. Um, but then they addressed that, they fixed it. I think there's a lot of people in election security who kind of keep an eye on those. So I don't know. I don't know, man. I think I think people really like, you know, people think that they're easier to hack than they are. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't the opposite side of that though, which is, you know, voter suppression and voter intimidation and all this kind of stuff. Right. So the so, you know, these machines are are only as viable as you being able to get to one on election day. Right. Yeah. And that's where the problems are, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And voter suppression shows up in so many different ways. I mean, we're talking now about early voting in New York City, so great, opens the opportunity, but the lines are super long. Mm -hmm. There's not enough poll workers. Is that also a form of voter suppression? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the, you know, there, there's an interesting, and this is very much not a partisan issue. There's a very interesting like article in the Times right before the weekend about how the people who supervise the board of elections in, in New York state are chosen. We're the last state in the country where it's still a hundred percent political appointees where everybody's twin, one from each party. Mm -hmm. So for every role in running the elections from the director of the board of elections, all the way down to like the software engineers or the data scientists, there's a Republican and a Democrat in each job is a paid person. And they're all in there. Um, it's a form of political patronage. Mm -hmm. So, um, so a lot of the electoral officials in New York State aren't actually professional anything. They're 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 spouses or cousins or brothers-in-law or friends of local electeds, and that's maybe not great, right? Yeah. Um, it's interesting that they reinforce it. So there's always two of them from opposite parties, right? That maybe helps, but. If neither of those people know what they're doing, then you have a problem. Right. right? Then you have the five-hour-long line at the Barclays Center. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's um. So that's not great.
Um, so we titled today's session kind of how we got here, like how we got to where we are. So looking forward, where do we go? I mean, the machines have changed. We kind of showed everybody, you know, the, the 1920s looking version, the 60s, yeah, the, yeah. the 2000s hanging yeah, back. Yeah. Where are we going? With I mean, I mean so, we still have paper ballots here in New York. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, 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 if the, if, if, you know, if there were to be a government at the federal level, say, hypothetically in the future, that really, really, really wanted to take a take a take a pickaxe to this problem and make sure that everybody could vote. One of the things you would do is you would just really say election day is not the day you vote. It's the last day you can vote. Mm -hmm. You pre-roll it for weeks, possibly even a month, right? And then you make it so that there are multiple entry points to being able to do it. And at a certain point, we all have to basically just surrender on these machines and say, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a, a, a thing you either do through the mail or a thing you do online, you, you do on the computer. And if you need to go to a polling place, you go to a polling place because you don't have an internet connection at home and you can't mail it, right? So like it becomes, that lining up for the polling place on election day becomes the use case of last resort, not the use case of first resort, right? Um, I think that's pretty much the only really equitable way to kind of look mm -hmm. at this yeah. is, is to say, you know, I should be able to vote on my phone, right? I should be able to vote at the public library on a computer terminal. I should be able to vote on a public library on a computer terminal and somehow get a receipt either sent to my email or mailed back to me in a physical copy Right, this isn't, engineers always get really mad when you say the term, it isn't rocket science, but it isn't <laughs> rocket science, right? This is not actually rocket science. Um, this is really about, you know, good governance and equity and creating a, a scenario where people have the, have the ability to exercise their rights, right? So we have a, we have a, a Tandon, we have an amazing shop, right? The, the, called the Gov Lab, right? Mm -hmm. The governance lab, so my colleague, Beth Novak, who's, 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 like a trillion times more qualified to talk about this stuff than I am, but uh, but but really, you know, her 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 research practice and, and and the stuff she does there is all about this. Is all about figuring out how to improve the years of democracy, not just in America but all over the world, right? She does she does consulting work for countries all over the world, and you know, it's everything from um, how to improve local engagement in local politics to how to allow for you know, citizen driven political action. So things you would think of as ballot initiatives. Mm -hmm. How do we make that not a thing that only happens every four years in a yes or no, but how can that be an ongoing conversation, right? I remember when I lived in the Upper West Side, there was a woman in my building who served on the community board. Mm, yeah. And she figured out that I didn't have a real job, right? She figured out that like, oh, there's this guy on the third floor and he's a musician, which means that like during the day, I can grab him and haul him to these meetings. Yeah. And so she would like knock on my door and be like, Luke, Thursday at four, you gotta come, you gotta come to this meeting. They're gonna put a goddamn Gristetti's in the, in, in the twin cinema on 99th street. We have yeah. to stop it. And I would be like, why are you calling me? And you realize it's because if you're smart and if you run the government and you don't really want the citizens to participate, you will do all your community board hearings at four o'clock uh -huh. on, on a Thursday in the basement of a Lutheran church that no one's ever been to, yeah. right? So that's, yeah. like a, that's like how you do it, right? Okay. Um, and so I was one of, and so she would drag me to these meetings, right? And I would, I would, and I would be like her plant. She would be like, I want you to raise your hand and I want you to ask how many grocery stores we actually need. Yeah. And I would be like, okay, you know, and I would like do my thing. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, that's, you know, and I was always like a little befuddled by the whole thing because I think we actually need more grocery stores. So I, I don't really, I don't really know what she was on about, but the, but the whole, but that yeah. was, you know, but that kind of like super local concerns, yeah. you know, are often, you know, not illuminated for the everyday people. Like it's not really about, if we had a country that worked a little bit better, it really wouldn't be about like once every four years we pick a president, mm -hmm. it should be more like once every two weeks, we actually engage on something that we care about. Yeah. 
yeah. it's a rolling thing. Yeah, yeah, no, when I told someone I voted in, in 2019, they looked at me and said there was no election in 2019. And I was like, no, no, there was for local things. Um, and I've also actually been to a community board meeting, which is always a fun experience. If you live in New York and have never been to a community board meeting, um, they are often at very random times, but I highly recommend it. Uh, it will definitely give you an interesting view on your neighborhood and, and what your neighborhood values. My neighborhood does not value bike lanes. Um, if you ever want to see a very active community board meeting, go to one when they are talking about removing parking spaces and adding bike lanes. Uh, you will see some interesting sides uh, of, of your felony record. Yeah, for so, sure. People are a trip. Yeah. Are a trip. Awesome. Well, we're going to leave you with a couple of reminders because we're at yep. time which is um, election day is Tuesday. If you have not already voted, um, please do so. If you're in New York, early voting is open through Sunday. Um, and you can also drop off a mail-in ballot at any early voting place, um, as well as your board of elections. Um, so you have multiple options to drop it off. You can still mail it if you're concerned about the mail. I feel you. Um, and you can drop it off in person very, very easily um, at any early voting place. And don't get deterred by the lines if you're dropping off there's often somebody going up and down the lines asking if anybody's dropping off and they'll let you come out and just drop it and leave. Um, so definitely do that. Uh, on Tuesday night, Wagner Vote 2020 Project is hosting an election night watch party. If you're interested, I think it starts at seven, um, which is about, I think the first time polls start to close. Um, they're gonna be doing tons of like mindfulness and counseling, like wellness stuff, but then also talking about issues. Um, and there's a ton of programming next week uh, if you're interested in the election. Um, but also take care of yourself. You know, this is a really stressful time for a lot of us. A lot of people are, are facing a situation where their rights and their identities are under question. Um, so please make sure that you are taking care of yourself in this process. If you need to take a break from the election, you can do that too. Um, there's nothing that says you have to watch it. Um, but, and we may not have results right away for the first time in uh, probably since 2000, when we had to wait for the Supreme Court decision, we may not have results right away. Um, but you can check out all that information um, on NYU Votes website. If you saw my little button that's rolling out here, um, NYU Votes, follow them on, on uh, Instagram. I think they're also on Twitter. Um, tons of great information. And they also have an email address, which is nyu-votes at nyu.edu. Um, and they get answer questions for you if you're having trouble getting to the polls, don't know where your polling place is, don't even know if you're registered, um, they can help you out. So definitely check that out. And I want to, okay, Randy, oh, Randy's putting it in the uh, in the chat. Thank cool. you, Randy, I appreciate that. Um, and I wanna just um, thank Luke for setting all of this up. Yeah, for sure. For inviting me over um, to 370J. It's been just like awesome to be in conversation with somebody else and not be in my apartment by myself. So. Thank you so much. And um, Randy or Deanna, do you want to do a plug for the next Hand and Teaches session before we close? I probably should have asked you this earlier. And if not, that's cool. Sure. Um, our next session is, let me get my schedule up. It's going to be on Wednesday, November 11th, 1230 p.m. Um, it's Let's Talk About Sex. We have NYU's um, Sexpert. Um, she's our sex educator here for NYU Central, Alyssa DeFosse. Um, and she will be talking and taking some questions about how we can be safe during COVID times and just general questions. So if you want to follow us on social media at NYU Tandon SA, um, we're also going to be doing some polls leading up to that to take some questions as well. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. So thank you all so much um, for joining us. We super, super appreciate it. Um, thanks again to Luke for, for yeah. being willing to do this with us. Thank you for hanging. Um, yeah, this and fun. this is super fun. I feel like I'm like on a television set um, <laughs> and like interviewing and like having my prepared questions. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, and remember, definitely get out and vote um, if you can. And uh, if you're not eligible to vote, I'm sorry, uh, but that's where we are. And um, no matter what, just remember your vote counts, your vote matters. Democracy is not a spectator sport. That's right. Awesome. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, guys. See you soon.